Okay, I think we can start, right? Um, so this afternoon we have a second demo uh, on visualization by Stefan. Um, Stefan is uh, currently finishing up his PhD in real-time MRI methods, uh, development and validation, and he's of course passionate about open science. And in this demo, he will uh, visualize uh, data interactively with Plotly and Dash. And I guess I'm quite sure he will use the, the example that he made during his PhD is also a hackathon project, the MRI uh, app and uh, app plot and everything around it. Um, so I'm very interesting to see what he will show us. Go ahead. I <laughs> promised a very short introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, so there's a bunch of links that we are going to use during this session and they're all in the chat. So if you want to check out the slides, or follow along now or later, you can do that. And most of the other links are also inside the slides that you can access from there. And I will tell you when it's uh, useful. Um, the first thing that you might want to do is in the um, first repository, um, part one repository, there's a binder um, instance or, or uh, sorry, quickly show you. So if you go to the second part, uh, second slide there, part one, this repository that's also linked from the OpenMR program, you'll see this and there is a launch binder button that you can click probably now. Um, and I'll show some examples um, on that. I will show everything on my screen so you, you are not uh, required to follow along on your side, but if you want to, you can. So I will speak a bit about um, interactive data visualization and I will probably say the word wrong. I say data and data and I say visualization and I make it into one f fuzzy sounding word. So please excuse me for that. And um, uh, I will speak about what I uh, do when I think about clear data vis visualization versus interactive data visualization. And then I will give you some demos about Plotly and Dash and show you how to quickly deploy a Dash board. Um, there's the material and um, I use a lot of memes, so I hope you like them. Ooh, there's a lot of the buttons, sorry. Okay, so most of us work with data. Um, I don't think that's very controversial to say. Uh, we plot data, we plot it typically in static figures, and we typically put that into a PDF format when we publish a paper. And that's also how we read this content. We'd see a picture, uh, X and Y axis, and there's some scattered data across that, or we see a slice of a brain, uh, or whichever MRI type you work with. Um, and we work with, with this type of data, but there are richer online formats available, and there are more... Um, interactive ways of plotting your data. Um, but still, we, we have this legacy system. And, and mostly, I want to say it's, it's not the individual's fault or the group's fault. It's just our legacy systems work. So you get set in certain way of doing things. And it's really a big effort to change that after a while. Um, so uh, don't feel too bad about not using interactive stuff. But I want to show you what are some options about getting into interactive data visualization if you are interested. It shouldn't have to be that difficult for us um, because like I said, the tools are out there uh, and we can use them. We don't necessarily have to be hardcore programming experts um, if, if you wanted to make the same type of data visualization plots that you do now versus 20 years ago, maybe then you would have had to be uh, an expert in programming and Python and uh, JavaScript and some libraries and know how to put them all together. But now there are tools that help us that have already put them all together. And I want to show you a bit about that. Also, you shouldn't feel shame. Uh, people shouldn't say, oh, you're this kind of renegade hippie who wants to only work with Plotly or, or uh, some browser formats or whatever. But um, as this uh, example shows, I think, um, we should try these things out um, and we should not let legacy systems hold us back because we, we need to be part of that uh, change that we want to see um, going forward. So I want to first start by saying, ah, I want to start again 
by resharing my screen because I didn't click the sound button and I want to do that. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing my screen and then share again. Share computer sound. Yep, stop two and share. So I want to show you an example of what I see as clear data visualization and interactive data visualization. I think clear data visualization allows a bunch of things, and this is from personal experience. It's not like I've studied this field in depth, so there might be more important and other things to, to show. Um, but I uh, think what's nice about this is that you can have abstraction with clear data visualization. What I mean with this is you can have data that's in the form of, like, let's say you have a brain image with a bunch of voxels and each one has a intensity. Um, and you can put all of those intensities into a graph that says a, hint, a histogram, for example. And that can show us um, an abstraction because look at the graph, you can understand the graph, but you don't have to think about the, the brain voxels. It can convey differences. So if you, sh if you plot histograms for different intensities of different um, uh, parts of the brain, and you can see this one is centered around the peak of a low value and this one around the high value. And you can also, um, uh, let's see, you can underlie, uh, identify underlying information. So things that you might not have seen if you just look at the image, you can see if you plot it in different ways. It allows us to draw inferences so we can say, oh, th these things are different and maybe that might mean something. Um, and then the next logical step for me is also taking a practical step based on that information. If it means something, then maybe I can improve someone's health with that information. So if I then go over uh, to the example that I want to show you, and please shout out if you can't hear the sound. The scale of a billion dollars is really crazy. So let's say one grain of rice is equivalent to 100K and 10 grains of rice would be then a million. Well, how much is a billion? So my Saturday night consisted of counting 10,000 grains of rice one by one, just to show you guys how much a billion dollars is. Of course I filmed it and of course I time-lapsed it and this is playing at, I don't even know, God knows how fast it's playing at, but. So now I'm proud to present to you the results. That is a billion dollars where each grain of rice is worth 100K. Look how much rice this is, guys. That's crazy. I just bought you like a Lamborghini right here and I didn't even notice it was gone. Here's a $5 million house in California. And oh look, I still have all this money. If you guys like that content, please follow me. I drop a video on personal finance every day. Thanks. Yep, so that is a really awesome video. Um, and it makes it extremely clear. And there's a follow up as well that I wanna show you. The scale of a billion dollars is Sorry. really crazy. So let's say- In my last video, I counted 10,000 grains of rice, where each grain of rice was $100,000. And that was to show you the scale of a billion dollars. Well, a lot of you guys asked me, well, how much does Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos have in terms of rice? So that was my mission. I went to Target, I bought a digital food scale, I came home, and then I weighed the rice that was worth 1 billion from earlier. I did the math in my head, and I went to Costco. I got the rice, I brought it home, and once I brought it home, I went to work. I also want to say that I have five families that are going to take this unused race, so it's totally not wasteful. Okay, so the moment you've been waiting for, 100K, 1 million, 1 billion, Jeff Bezos has 122 of these, or 58 it's pounds like of rice. 200. If each grain of rice was 100K. Like, look how big this is, guys. I'm going to show you the scale here. I'm going to put a keyboard in just for fun. Look how deep that goes. That's insane. This is Jeff Bezos' his new house that's $145 million in LA. And then, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, if you want to, I think you should go check out some more videos of this guy on TikTok. Um, it's really informative and it's- In my last video, I counted 10,000 grains of rice. Sorry. So the, the reason I like this, these videos um, is, because it, it makes a clear data visualization case. So there's abstraction. So we th if you think of money and zeros and zeros and zeros, uh, it may, might become difficult, especially if it's, if it's uh, so much that billionaire, billionaires have. But if you think about it in terms of rice grains, one versus a heap, that's much easier to understand. 
uh, visually. It allows for giving differences. So one grain versus multiple bags or versus a small heap. It identifies underlying information. Holy, uh, whatever swear word you want to say, billionaires are really rich compared to everyone. And also drawing inferences. Uh, perhaps this is not great. Perhaps uh, this is something we need to do something about. And then you can take a practical next step depending on your uh, persuasion. <laughs> so um, I think clear data visualization is important. And it can definitely be done with basic uh, plotting libraries, or not basic, but existing standard ones that don't necessarily support interactivity. And it can definitely be done in a 2D way in a PDF, but I do think that interactivity can help um, with better uh, understanding these concepts underlying the data and also making our work more accessible. So I'm gonna speak a bit more about those aspects. So first now I'm gonna go over to an example so uh, if you go into that binder environment, you'll see, see some plots. You can run through these things. If you attended the Jupyter Notebook workshops this morning, this is a Jupyter Notebook. I'm running it locally on my device now, but um, you can also run it in the binary environment. Um, this is just explaining a few things, but this is where I want to start. So I work with fMRI data. I work with... Um, time series of fMRI data. And um, we often calculate the temporal signal to noise ratio. And this is what's displayed in, in these images. And we typically or want to see what's the temporal signal to noise ratio in gray matter versus white matter versus cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So I have some data in a CSV that has the values for the different voxels in the brain for these different tissue types. And if I run that, I load the data and this is what the data looks like. So it's columns and rows, gray matter, um, TSNR, white matter, TSNR, et cetera, et cetera. So I can plot these things, right? I, I work now with Matplotlib that's available in Python and I plot box plots because often if we have lots of data, we summarize it in box plots and it gives us like the median values, the quartile values, and also some outliers if they are there. And now we can easily see Okay, white matter, the average TSNR is, is the most compared to the rest, and CSF is quite low. But this is a static image. So what I mean with we can benefit from interactivity is that if I run the same command, but I just add this line, matplotlib widget, um, which helps us interactively explore data in, in the Jupyter Notebooks with matplotlib, then I get something like that. So, uh, so I changed this widget aspect, which gives us interactivity. So I can drag and drop the data like that. It is quite slow, which I don't like, but you get some more interactivity. You can explore the data. You can look more at these values and I can scroll there and I can see what the values of Y is in this area below. I also changed um, some colors. Um, so I didn't only change that line of code. But this change of colors is what I um, uh, did in order to make it more comparable to when I plot the same data with a different toolbox or, or package that is, which is called Plotly. So I do the following one. And there's the same data, also box plots uh, created with Plotly, but now there's already much more interactivity built into this example. So I have hovering over the data, it immediately gives me the values of the quartiles and the medians. I can use the legend to exclude or include some of the data very easily. I can drag in or scale like this much more easily. I can hover over the data points. So it's a, the interactivity and, and accessibility of the data itself is, is a bit better in my opinion with Plotly. The nice thing about, about Plotly here is I can also write this whole file to an HTML file. So if I execute this and I go to where the data is saved, there I have the box plot saved as an HTML file. And you can send this by email to your collaborators. So now immediately, it's not like you just show them a screenshot of your MATLAB or Python plot 
uh, as you as you plot it that they cannot interact with now you show you um, send them something that they can open in their browser and they can interact with it for example i uploaded that image to my website so anyone can access this you can also access this on that url and you can scroll in the same way through the data i don't need anything installed locally it just runs in the browser hopefully it <laughs> runs in your browser so um that's very nice. It's accessible and also interactive. Now going back to my uh, slides. Ooh, did I skip something? Yeah, so great. We have interactivity, we can benefit from that, but it's not all about interactivity. I think some of you might have seen this uh, animation before. And it's basically showing us different groupings of data that all yield the same mean values, standard deviation, and correlation. So I can plot a dinosaur, or I can plot circles or a star. I, if I plot, if I if I draw a box plot on this data, it will look the same, and I will not understand what my data looks like. So interactivity is not giving you a full representation necessarily of your data. Clear data visualization does, does that. So it's not all about interactivity. It's also about plotting all of your data. And that's that's a lesson we all should, should learn at some point. Um, and that I still learn every day when I plot stuff. It's just getting down to plot each of the data points or distributions of that. And I want to show another example of that as well. Going back to the Jupyter notebook that I was just browsing through. So if I have the box plot of these data, sure, I can see CSF TSNR is quite low, which I expect because um, there's a lot more fluctuations in the fluid in our brains than there are, for example, in the white matter tracks of our brains. And the signal fluctuation decreases the signal to noise ratio. But if I plot distributions now instead of box plots, and this is called violent plots, I can see some more underlying data. So I can see the same median values. I can still see that white matter is the highest and CSF is the lowest, but I can now see this extra peak here in the brain TSNR and gray matter TSNR. That's like, okay, maybe I should frown a bit at that and try to understand. And if I look at the peak in the CSF distribution, it kind of agrees with that peak, which leads me to think, okay, maybe when I masked my data, some values that are actually part of the CSF were wrongly included in the gray matter values or grouping. Um, and that can make me think, okay, but perhaps I should have a look again at my segmentation procedures or at my registration procedures. So it can really make you think about your whole pipeline and say, okay, but I need to go correct these things. I need to take these masks that I created and dilate or erode them to exclude values that, that won't give a, a correct representation of the data. So plot your underlying data. I think that's a good lesson for all of us. And then I go back to this part. So interactive data visualization allows us to do lots of things. You can have multiple plots in one, you can scroll and drag and drop and hover and click buttons and all of those nice things, but essentially it means you can explore data as opposed to just looking at it. I think that's a, a bit of a shift, which I think we should explore more. Um, when we start sharing our results, sharing it in a format where people can explore and not just look at the inferences that you already made because the data is static. And then also it allows redistribution of the rice grains, which I think is socially a nice concept, but, but also with regards to science, it makes accessibility easier. You can send the HTML file by email to your collaborators. You can upload it somewhere where someone else can access it and they can participate. And I really like that aspect of interactive data visualization. So it really allows us then to get from a PDF with a static image that we read somewhere and perhaps we have to pay like a crazy amount of money for that, which we shouldn't do. You should just use PSYOP if you want to access, <laughs> well, um, whatever, do what you want. <laughs> but anyways, um, uh, the interactive data visualization uh, helps us to really share data that's open and interactive 
and share it in the form of an application that people can then explore data. So that, that's like galaxy brain explosion, but how do we get there? So in this, in this demo, we're looking at Python, Party, and Dash. So Python, I guess we're all familiar with that in some ways, having heard about it or using it. Uh, it's an open source language. It's compatible with a bunch of graphing libraries. So you've, you've perhaps heard of or used Matplotlib, Seaborn, Altair, Bokey or Bokeh, I don't know, Plotly, Plot9, all of these things. Um, and it also has a, lot, a bunch of like domain specific libraries that, that has even more plotting functionality like Nylearn, which I'm, I have a few examples from. So there's a few links if you want to visit, but Python is kind of the basis. So it's open source. You don't have to pay for it. Well, those are two things. Then we have Plotly. Plotly is actually a company, um, but they develop lots of open source tools. So um, they have these graphing libraries that have um, that are compatible with different um, languages. So they have one for Python, they have one for R, and also for JavaScript. And the cool thing is about this aspect of interactivity. Now, some of these also allow interactivity, um, definitely, uh, and you can just as well use them. But for today's talk, I'm focusing on Plotly and Dash. Then we have Dash. So Dash is a framework for building web analytic applications. So you can use a lot of Plotly functionality. You can build everything on top of Python, and then you can design applications that's more user-friendly for people to explore your data, right? So you can um, uh, uh, use whatever favorite packages you use. If you like Nylearn, if you uh, like um, scikit-learn, if you like whatever type of Python package, you can import it. Um, and then use that together with Plotly graphs or other types of graphs, but then host it in an environment that's that's web friendly, and then other people can access interactively. And and there's just some technical details. So it uses Flask as the as the database and setup and and the whole web frame setup. It uses the Plotly J the JavaScript graphing library, and then also React. Uh, which is useful for um, user interfaces. So when you press buttons and you want to, to do something or when you have drop down lists and actions and all those things that you typically access in your applications in the, in the browser, um, that's what that is useful for. And it makes it easier for us to deploy it from start of have a graph and then deploy it in Dash. So I want to start by first showing a few interactive um, examples of brain data um, and some with Plotly and some with uh, Python packages and then I'll carry on with the dashboard. Uh, so in the same binder environment, in the same uh, Jupyter notebook, if you just scroll a bit down, there's fur further examples of Plotly. Actually, I can show you what Plotly site looks like and there are so many things you can you can do. So all of the standard graphs you typically would do, there's a lot that focuses on machine learning, lots of things with maps, financial charts. So you can really do a lot here, 3D stuff. Um, yeah. So please have a look. But if we go back to the Jupyter Notebook, I want to show some more interactive stuff that I like, and it's basically just because it's cool to show interactive, nice widgets and uh, things like that. So in this case, we're working with Nylearn and um, it's neuroimaging and learn, so machine learning. So making statistical methods and machine learning easier with neuroimaging. And they have a bunch of cool aspects that help with plotting your data. So for example, the plot a nut, which is plot an anatomical image. So in this case, I'm using the same data that we used in the, this morning's workshop. And um, I'm plotting an anatomical image. And this is just also still using that um, from up above here when I uh, plotted this graph. And now it's slow. Okay. So when I said matplotlib widget, uh, that, that command is still active. So it it just runs the same 
plot here in the same type of widget. So it's actually not interactive in itself. But if I go uh, down here and I want to take this anatomical image and I want to make it a bit more interactive or do something like this, that is possible with Plotly. Um, and I took some code that I found on the Plotly site and I adapted it for this anatomical image. This is just an animation. It's not the actual data that's being rendered here because it renders a very huge file that I don't want to make things slow. So I just made an animation of, of what this code can do. But here's the whole code block if you want to execute that locally. So basically, you can run through these slices and just display them. Maybe it's useful if you want, if there's like a, a, a tumor, for example, that's been imaged that you want to show as it runs through it or something. Stephanie, um, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, your screen is quite low resolution. I don't know if, um, well, some others already experienced that problem. I don't know if that's... Um, I have it too. He has the same for me as well. Oh, man. I also thought it was my internet connection. But yeah, same only, for me. <laughs> only now or from the start? No, no, no uh, only now. Um, well, it's so. getting worse, I think. <laughs> Perhaps it's because of that animation. I don't know. And if I if I do this, does it change? No, it's actually worse. <laughs> okay, that's uh, irritating. Um, if what if I uh, what if I share a different screen? Let's see. I'm going to stop share and then I'll just share my screen locally. I didn't have a problem when you just shared the, the slides, actually. Mm -hmm. And was the Jupyter Notebook fine in the beginning? Mm -hmm. it, it was okay, but it, it wasn't very... It's getting better now. Getting better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. Maybe the Jupyter Notebook is just... Yeah, I well, think that might be the case. Okay, so if, if it doesn't improve, please let me know. Then I will change. Otherwise, I'm going to keep it as is. Otherwise, I can also, because I also have the binder open and stuff, and I can also go further and we can try it, but that's perhaps the last resort. Yeah, yeah I think uh, let's... Uh, I just want to quickly show this. I'm, I'm going to continue with, this, with the slides, and, and then when I go back to my screen and, and it's still bad, then I will just show it on a different screen, okay. perhaps. Now, it, now it's okay. It just... Uh, <laughs> Okay. The, uh... Yeah, it's a quick scrolling, I think, maybe. Ah, okay. Okay, so, so yes, you can plot an interactive uh, plotly animation that goes through the different slides of your anatomical image. Um, then there's something like this plotting um, the statistical maps on a brain that we, if we, if you do with fMRI, you should be probably quite familiar with. Um, this is a nice feature in that you can uh, interactively scroll through this. So inside the image, you can scroll through where there was a lot of activation. You can see the different areas, see the locations, etc. And again, you can export this as an HTML and send it to people. This is another option, not plotting it in three dimensions, three views, but plotting it on the surface of the brain and allowing the brain to be scrolled like this. I hope this is showing in okay resolution on everyone's screens. Um, so this shows you not only with standard kind of CSV data, but also with uh, other graphical data, um, 3D views, brains, statistical maps. You can have a lot of interactivity and you can have a lot of accessibility by saving these things and sharing it. Right. Let me see what's next. Ah, well now I'm going to go back again. <laughs> so I want to start or say first that I've now shown a bunch of examples of Plotly, and now you can make your data interactive with that. I've also shown how you can make your data inter interactive using some standard uh, Python packages. And now we want to go to Dash. Um, so Dash allows us to take bring everything of this together into an application that's much more intuitive for users and it allows data exploration and you can put it in the web. And so I want to show you this example of one I built for a paper. So I'm, I'm envisioning this kind of future where um, people are publishing uh, kind of resource outputs like this and, and not necessarily only 
PDF paper. So really opening your data and code, but in a way that people can explore it. So I'm hoping this uh, renders okay on everyone's screens. Yeah. But you can easily go to the same uh, URL. So it was for some work I did on real-time multi-ego fMRI. And this is like a web page. So you can click on the different buttons and you can see different views. So for example, here I explain what the data is and what it should do. Hopefully it renders okay. Um, I explain the rationale of the study, give some links, give a picture of how the data um, is structured. Uh, but also I uh, share data in the sense that people can then explore the data. So often when you see a data set, you want to understand, is the quality fine? Can I use it? And you don't necessarily want to uh, process everything on your own. Uh, this often takes a while to load. But now people can go and see what's the quality of the head movement of the fMRI uh, research data participants, uh, because that's often a quality issue. So who moved the most? Can I scroll over this? Yes, I can. I can view the different ones. And for example, I see subject 10. Looks like there's a bunch of outliers. So if I go here to subject 10, what does that mean? It takes a while. Ooh, it looks different. And here you can see each of these bars is a time series of head movement. So, and um, each bar is a different run of fMRI collection. So in six runs, they moved a lot, um, this person, uh, which is not ideal. But if you look at, say, subject one, it should change. Yeah, and they didn't move so much. So that's great. And so immediately with using this interface, you can get a better grasp of the data and the data quality. And I also have a bunch of other stuff. The tasks here, you can see I use those um, interactive uh, task activity viewers. So it really shows the where you have certain regions that are active or not. Um, you can see, put some tables in the data, uh, in the interface. So I can see a bunch of quality metrics for every single subject and the different tasks that they executed in the scanner. Uh, yes, all of those things. And you can also um, include, uh, I wonder if I have some other demonstrations. Don't think so. But I, here, here I have a bunch of those violent plots. Something that's also cool about Plotly is you can, you can change what, what is um, displayed when you hover over data. So just by adding some code, you can say it should, should give the data point, it should name the, the participant number or something like that. And you can also do a lot of different change your information based on drop downs, etc. So I think something like this should be very useful for, for any of us who want to report uh, scientific results. So I'm now at that point and now we're carrying on with this. So the next part is dedicated to just taking you on a walkthrough of how to get from zero to a dashboard. Um, and mostly, uh, because of the fact that I have an inability to, to, to focus on the important stuff and I tend to be distracted by cool new tools. So back to my screen. Um, the important part about understanding Dash is that you should look at their documentation. They, their documentation is awesome. So it takes you through a whole uh, st uh, set of steps of what is Dash, go through a tutorial, build a very small app from, from, the, uh, from the start, uh, which parts do you need to add? How can you make it um, bigger and better over time? And uh, the cool thing is that everything of, of Python, probably Dash is for free and open source. And also um, the deployment can also be for free. So not necessarily that you can build this cool app and only view it on your own or only have other people view it if they have the same type of setup. You can deploy it for free using a service that makes it accessible, such as the, the website that I just showed you. 
Um, so I want to show you quickly in my code how this would be set up. Um, as a summary, you can go to this, the second part. So in the first repository, I showed you there's a bunch of content. And then uh, here I demonstrate the last part of the demo, which is accessible at this repository. So if you open the second repository, there you will find a bunch of instructions, an explanation of what I'm doing now. Um, and you can also see the, the sample app that we're going to go through now there, but I'll, I'll come back to this link. And also, if you want to do these things on your own, I also give some explanations here. So how to do all of the stuff that I'll do now. And this means I will set up a, a Python environment. I will create a Git repository. I will set it up with the basic um, uh, files that it needs for a Dash app. I will then start prototyping, coding some stuff, and then we'll deploy it on Heroku, which is a platform that you can run some free apps on. And they run it for you in the cloud and people can access it on the internet. And then we have an app. So that's quickly what I'll show. So this is, let's close that part. I'm having uh, this whole application is called VS Code and it's a nice way to code. Uh, in my application, I have assets, which is just some figures that I want to show in my application. I have data, which is my TSNR data that we used in the previous Jupyter Notebook. And then I have Git Ignore, which is standard for a Git uh, repository. And I have a few important parts. Also standard for the Git repository is a license file and the readme. But the important parts for the Dash app is the app.py. That's easy. There's a proc file, which is used for the deployment uh, on Heroku. And there's a requirements because it needs to understand which packages are required for you to run this whole thing. So in my app, which I'll explain, uh, mostly is this whole Python file. Everything is Python. So you import your packages that you need. I prepare my data the same as I did in uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Then there's a few Seven. dash. Can yes. I just interrupt? Is it possible to like enlarge the oh, text yes. or something? Because it's very tiny. Sorry for that. Is this better? Yes, yeah, it's better for me. Yeah, for me too. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, so you have um, you import the packages that you need. You prepare your data, same as you would have if you wanted to plot your figures uh, elsewhere. And there are some other aspects that you prepare as well. So I prepare the plotly graph and I prepare some values for drop downs that I want to use. Um, then I create my app, which is dash specific. Uh, I don't understand fully what everything happens here, but if you follow the instructions on, on their website, this is what you need to do. Then you have an app layout. So because our app is uh, in the browser, it uses a lot of HTML and CSS in order to just determine where should the heading be, what should be in which columns, and should this be styled in a certain way and should that be styled in a different way. Uh, and that is a way of, of uh, telling us how our app should look like. So there's a bunch of HTML components um, and all of these components are standard um, coming from the Dash packages. So there's a thing called Dash core components that you import. And there's also Dash bootstrap components, which is more about uh, styling certain of certain components in a certain way. And this is where, if you're not used to this type of coding, where it perhaps gets a bit more complicated because you now you need to start styling the things with HTML essentially. So you just add your components like a heading or a column or a row or a button or a figure wherever you want them with some styling attributes. And then there's thing called app callbacks because what we need to do is if we click a button, we want to, for example, change a graph. And this is how this is done. And this is where the React part comes in. So you, you program your app callbacks with the React um, protocol and it just 
essentially this, this, this uh, uh, says what is the output of this callback and what's the input. So the input is, in this case, is, it comes from drop plot options. So the drop down with the plotting options is my input. If I change the drop down, then I change figure three. All right, so, and then there's the code for changing figure three. There's another callback and then I run the app. All right, these are the main components of a basic app. Uh, so what I do then, on a different screen, and I'm also gonna make this a bit larger. Uh, git demo, I think this is the wrong file. Uh, so I'm running this in a virtual environment, and now I say python app.py. I'm going to test my app because I've coded it now. Hopefully it works. Yes. So server is running. I can access dash locally. So this is all done locally now. So at this address, I can go to my browser and I can see what I just built. And it, it sounds like my daughter is waking up from her uh, afternoon nap. Um, and this is what I built, right? So there's a nice picture at the beginning. There's some headings and some, some markdown. There's two columns. There's a drop down. If I change the drop down, it should change the graph. Changes, yeah. And all of you can also try this at home when you have some time. And here I also just render the HTML from that st statistical map that I saved out of the Jupyter Notebook. So this doesn't run off of local data. It is just the HTML that I embedded here. Um, the next step is then to take this. I can, I can um, the very cool thing about Dash is I can um, change things and prototype it very quickly. So if I want to change the, the markdown, the awesome tools. Okay. so save and i go back here now it should refresh soon yes it's loading it and there it says awesome all right so very quickly you can prototype a dash app and really immediately see your changes and then uh, you add your proc file which is required by heroku in order to show um, the whole setup what how it needs to run uh, online, and then you need to deploy this whole setup to Heroku. Um, I'm not going to run through the details of that, but all of that is contained. You do it in your command line, and the instruction for that is in the repository for this application. And then finally, you end up with the application itself, which you can access here. So the one you just saw was running in my browser locally, but this one is running on Heroku because I deployed it like five minutes before <laughs> this presentation. And you'll see it looks a bit different. Um, and that often happens and you need to figure out how to style it locally such that it renders nicely remotely. But it's, it's got the same functionality essentially. And you can also access these things and make it nicer. So that is how you deploy a Dash app. And then to round off, I would like to say that a lot of this can be a bit overwhelming if you're not familiar with it. And it still is quite overwhelming for me, especially if I'm trying to fit it into 45 minutes. But the important part for me is that we should be start becoming more aware of the tools that are out there to be able to help us build interactive applications, but not even interactive applications right down just to the figure that you can have more control and of your data and, and allow people to explore it more. So if you take away one thing is that perhaps instead of creating a figure in MATLAB or Python or uh, whichever uh, thing you use that's not interactive or that's not that's only a static figure that doesn't allow you fully to explore the data, perhaps try out Plotly and export the HTML and send that to your collaborators and see if they can find out more inf information um, that's underlying in the data because now they can explore it quickly without you having to organize a meeting in two weeks time. So thank you.
Um, please ask questions, uh, uh, but thanks for your attention. Very nice. This is the first time I saw a TikTok video in a talk. <laughs> That's, it, it, well, perhaps that's also one of the other takeaway, take home points. If you take anything away, you watch some videos on TikTok, but don't get addicted uh, like I am. But if it shows you that billionaires, billionaires are evil people, then it's fine to get addicted for a short while. Um, perhaps, Stefan, can, can I um, perhaps add a little bit on your presentation? Sure. Because um, first of all, thank you, thank, thank you very much for me. It was also very much of an, an eye opener, uh, but it actually overlaps partly with uh, what I did, uh, I guess, half a year ago. Um, also, um, to trying to get a paper into some kind of interactive, um, well, an interactive uh, application hosted on the web. So perhaps I can also share my screen briefly, and then I can offer people yet another tool that they can use to deploy something like this. I don't know. If that's uh, I stopped. Uh, I stopped sharing, so you can go ahead. Okay, thanks. So, for example, if you look at my screen right now, uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is Streamlit. This is uh, something I don't know if people are already familiar with that. Um, but Streamlit is also some kind of framework that works uh, similarly. So there's also a big community. It's it's actually enlarging. And since I guess half a year ago, because it was very close to the moment when I actually deployed it, that it was um, that you were able to deploy it on the web. Um, you can actually also. Um, they host it for you and you can very easily also uh, get your script into some kind of uh, interactive application by solely using Python in this case. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the nice advantage that you have also over here. There's, uh, it also makes it very easy for you to deploy something. So for example, um, this was on a paper on uh, cognitive scores and for example, how, they, uh, how uh, certain uh, demographic variables uh, alter cognitive scores. So for example, if you look uh, over here, this is the normal curve. And uh, if you're in the red zone, you're actually scoring bad on that score. So if I'm, for example, saying, okay, my SDMT score over here is like this, then their app is running again. This is taking quite long. So I, I'm still quite convinced that the way uh, that it was perhaps a little bit faster in Stefan's case, but just to show you. Um, and for example, if I now um, go to doctorate, and I uh, score the same on the SDMT, then my expected score is of course feel, uh, feel <laughs> is of course far lower because uh, yeah, you're expected to uh, score higher on this cognitive test. So just to give you an impression of how this can also work for you and how easy it is um, to, because this is the GitHub uh, repository that hosts that, uh, that, um, that web application. And you can see it's just import streamlet over here. I think it's there import streamlit as st and then you can say i want to add an image i want to add a title i want to write something a markdown etc and the only thing is that it offers less freedom so the thing is what you do uh, stefan is far more flexible you can put things uh, everywhere on your screen but streamlit just gives you this kind of overview always um, you have some kind of styles and themes you can choose from right now. I think it's also being built in the, uh, there have been a lot of updates in the past half a year, I guess. Um, and then you can uh, take the theme that you, uh, that you like and then just start deploying your web, uh, your web application just by a very simple one Python. So perhaps that's also something oh. to consider. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. And this is the repo. So if you would like to go to there, uh, this is the repository. I will share it also in the chat. Okay, that was it. <laughs> Sorry to, uh, <laughs> but just to share it. Anyone else have uh, questions? <clears throat> yes, I have a question or sure. a remark or. Um, I am always wondering how long these kind of tools and platforms will stay. Um, like me, I'm the old-fashioned guy, so uh, <laughs> I save everything on disk. And um, but how long do you think these tools stay online, and how long does it will it take 
or does, will it take to, to port your uh, applications to another new platform? And that's something I'm struggling about and, and about loading new platforms just because I don't know what the lifetime of these things are. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, I guess, so I'm not a front-end uh, developer in any sense. I've worked with some some of these tools and work in teams that use these tools. And I know some people are also, like, for example, React. I know uh, some other alternatives are like Vue, which a lot of people are amped about. And some people say React will only be short-lived. So I, I cannot really comment on that. Um, um, but Sure, it is definitely something to, to take into account. At least the, the, the Python aspect, I think, is probably a bit more secure in terms of longevity. Um, so we have uh, we have Python and then um, the, the, the Dash aspect of, of, of making it easier to lay out your application would probably also need some form of um, some, some translation if you, if you need to port that. So the the HTML, the dash HTML and the the React components might need to be ported. So I guess the safe part is is not to build a too heavy production app on top of this, and and yeah, trying to do so more in, in the Python side. Yeah, that's also my guess. Just to to the upper front end in in some kind of uh, plotting platform, and all the rest in in a well established technology like. Python, as you do. Okay, thanks. Sure. I thought it was also a comment about uh, the platform I used uh, to host the application, which apparently in Portuguese sounds extremely bad. So I won't say it. But um, I have no idea. I've been used to it. And yeah, I guess it's just my um, language bias that I haven't been. Uh, um, exposed to this being a bad expression in Portuguese. Um, but that's how I learned saying it. That's how people in the development world say it. So, so somewhere, probably there's an article on the internet discussing this or on Reddit. So perhaps someone has a solution already. Can I ask a follow-up question related? Sure. So okay, thank you for the for the demo. I was wondering, in the practical uh, beyond like uh, the technical aspects, uh, how do you see we should use this technique? Like uh, that we write a paper and then we say, ah, look at this related website that you include pictures and each picture has its own ver uh, dynamic version of line. How do you? Uh, Considering so, in the end, uh, still the world still is run by pap scientific papers. Yeah, at the how moment, do we put these things together? I, so, so basically, when people use a, a way I've used it is there's this kind of accompanying uh, application that people that I encourage people to look at together with the paper, and I've I put it in the abstract. I put it in the data and and, and mm -hmm. code sharing section. And I also refer to it when I show the, 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 the images throughout the paper. Like it's kind of like supplementary material, but I don't like the fact that it's kind of put uh, on the second place or third place on the podium. When you say supplementary material, often people say, okay, but yeah, supplementary material means like unnecessary material because I only want to read the paper. Um, but this means that still the main attention will be on static images in the paper. Yes. So, I mean, at, at least current, in the current environment where we, where that is the focus, it's, that, it's this whole thing about the legacy system, like uh, there, will, there won't be kind of a rip and replace changeover. So I think it's the same as with how the incentives change with regards to open science or sharing stuff or not. I think it is a gradual change, but, but what I like is that when there's more like large level system level changes. For example, eLife um, has recently in the past few months or past year started a new type of article format where it's a living document where you would essentially be able to do the very same, the, pretty much the same things. And using basically similar technology, not Dash, but also Python and Jupyter Notebooks and, uh, 
uh, servers running from using that, um, that you can then put your code in the article and have people execute that code to generate the figure. So then as you read the kind of 2D article that's web hosted, you can see, okay, but if I, if I change the upper bit, if I want to look at the other variable, I can change the, the article while I read. I think that's what we're moving towards. And some journals are starting doing that, especially eLife. And I know in the human brain mapping space, they're doing that um, also with um, the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, they're doing that. Um, so more and more societies and, and journals are starting mm -hmm. out. And with more and more, I mean like a handful, but that's more than zero. <laughs>